and a very warm welcome to our YouTube channel. I really hope that you guys are doing well. So today our topic of discussion is going to be from modern India. So we have already started our discussion on some modern Indian topics, right? We've seen quite a few annexations, right? So now we move on to a very important topic today that we'll be discussing and that is causes of the revolt of 1857. Yes, this is what we will be discussing today, okay? So, what do we have here? So, we have the causes of the revolt of 1857. So, this is the causes of the war or the first war of independence, fine. So, this is what we will be discussing. So, here I have made these, I have made a, like a short flowchart kind of a thing. So, here we have political causes, administrative and economic causes. Then we have social, religious, military causes. So, these are few causes that we will be discussing which is the causes of the revolt of 1857. All right. So, let's start. Let us first discuss the political causes. Okay. So, you know, guys, when we're discussing the political causes, we must keep in mind all the annexations which the Britishers have carried on. Remember, we have discussed these policies of the Britishers in one of the YouTube lectures. Okay. So, the policies like Doctrine of Lapse and Wellesley's a subsidiary alliance, they played a very significant role in the background for the revolt. We have already had a discussion on what these policies are. Now, these policies created a lot of doubt in the minds of the people, particularly the royals who were affected by these policies. Like Rani Lakshmi Bai was affected by this. Nana Sahib was affected by this because he was the adopted son of Peshwa Baji Rao and he could not get the pension that Peshwa Baji Rao was getting just because he was adopted. So, this created a lot of doubts in the minds of the rulers, fine. And some of these rulers actually provided leadership for the revolt, isn't it? We have Rani Lakshmi Bai here. She was one of the leaders of the revolt. Okay. So, and the annexation of Avat on the grounds of misgovernance was highly resented. All right. Now, please understand that Avad has been called as the cradle of Bengal army. So, Bengal army was actually created by the people, by the youngsters or the people who were going from Avad. They were the ones who were joining in the Bengal army. So, the annexation of Avad on the basis, on the pretext of misgovernance and the exile that has uh, that Wajid Ali Shah has been sent on. This created a lot of dissatisfaction in the minds of the people. Not just emotional, but at the same time, economic dissatisfactions as well. So, uh, yes. So, Dalhousie removed Wajid Ali Shah from the throne of Awadh and he also humiliated the Mughal emperor by asking him to vacate the royal palace and not just vacating the royal palace, but he also asked him that you should not be using your titles from now on. You should refrain from using your titles of king, of queen, of princess or prince, etc. Now, this was seen as a very, you can say, a very uh, chot, jisko hum bolte. It was a, it was a hammer on the fabric of our nation, on the national fabric of our nation because Bahadur Shah Zafar was considered as the epitome or you can say he was considered as the highest source of authority for us because he was a representative of the Mughals at this point of time. So, that is your political causes. Okay. Now, I deeply heard the sentiments of the company's sepoys because most of them were coming from Avadh, as I told you. Peasants had to pay higher revenue and additional taxes were imposed. Now, please understand that when Avadh was annexed, okay, a, a summary settlement was imposed on Avadh. Now, what is summary settlement? Summary settlement is a kind of revenue settlement just like the permanent Rayatwari and Mehelwari, okay? So, under the summary settlement, around 75% of the income of individuals were being charged as revenue. 
Now imagine if I am working for the government, I am a soldier with the government, I am literally laying down my life for them and my parents are suffering, they are literally dying of starvation because they do not have enough money because all the money has been charged in the form of revenue. Do you think I will be happy working for the Britishers then? Absolutely not and this is exactly what happened with Awadh. At the same time, when you are, you know, sending the king on exile, as I told you, there was an emotional loss. Yes, you are sending my king on exile. But at the same time, there was an economic loss as well. So when the king is there, he has a court and he has a lot of people employed there. So king is a source of employment for many people. Now, when you are, you know, exiling the king, you are also taking away the employment of so many people. So the people of Awadh are suffering from all sides. And that is why Awadh was a major participant in the revolt. And it took Britishers around a year to repress Awadh. That's how strong the revolt was in Awadh. Okay. Now let us take a look at some of the administrative and economic causes. So, the company's ill-conceived, uh, you know, you can say the revenue settlements, the permanent Rayatwari, Mehelwari, all of this had a major impact on the people. 50 to 100 percent of their incomes were being charged in the form of revenue. How do you think the people are going to earn? So, people were dependent for their daily needs on the money lenders who were charging them with exuberant amount of uh, interest. So the people are suffering again from all directions. They are hardly earning anything. Whatever they are earning is being taken away by the Britishers. Okay, so that was an issue. Okay, so all the revenue policies which the Britishers have launched, this caused the economic decline of the peasants and this created extreme poverty with the peasants. Fine. So the economic decline of the peasantry found expression in the 12 major and new uh, minor famines. So, you know, these, uh, these revenue settlements have created major and minor famines in India. Fine. Now, these famines, please understand, they were not natural. They were man-made famines, right? Why were they man-made famines? Because the Britishers were not leaving enough with the peasants that they could invest back in their land. And when you don't invest in your land, you lose the productivity of the land. And when you keep cropping your land year after year after year, in the end, what you get is low productivity and crop failure. So this is why you have major and minor famines which happen between 1770 to 1857. Okay. There was something called the Sunset Clause or the Sunset Law. Fine. You can see a picture here of people who are starving to death. So, uh, what is the Sunset Law? What is the Sunset Clause? So, this was a clause associated with permanent settlement which stated that on the particular date on which the revenue has to be submitted. If you don't submit the revenue on that day, then the zamindar zamindari will get auctioned. So if I'm supposed to submit the revenue on 26, so by the end of the day of 26, if the revenue is not submitted, then if I am a zamindar, my zamindari will be auctioned. So that was the sunset clause. And this really, you know, restricted the powers of the zamindars and the talukdars and a lot of zamindars and talukdars actually started losing their estates because of this. Okay. Now, the condition of the Indian artisans and craftsmen became really miserable due to loss of patronage by Indian rulers as well as by the discriminatory mercantile policies of the British government. Religious preachers, pundits, Malvis felt that their entire future is being threatened and they also played a very important role in spreading hatred against the Britishers. Okay, let's talk about the social and religious causes. Now, the Charter Act 
Act of 1813. So for a very long time, Britishers have controlled the activities of the missionaries, fine. But the Charter Act of 1813 and 33 has given the Christian missionaries the right to preach and evangelize, which basically means conversion in India, fine. So the ways which they have adopted, they were sometimes forcing the people to convert into Christianity and this was seen as an attack on the minds and on the religious and cultural fabric of the Indians. They were really scared of these activities. And most importantly, the Britishers were actually endorsing these policies, fine. They have, the, uh, the missionaries have been given rights that yes, you can do these things, okay. So that is one major uh, cause, fine. Other than that, the abolition of Sati in 1829, Widow Remarriage Act of 1856 and the support given by the Britishers to women's education. Now, please understand that these are very good things which the Britishers have done. But from today's perspective, understand the perspective of people, orthodox people who are there in 1800s. Don't you think they will consider this as an invasion from the outsiders on their religious and social fabric? And this is something that the Indians did not like. They thought that the Britishers are trying to impose their religion or the Britishers are trying to impose uh, in the religion and the culture of Indians. They did not like these laws because these laws were deviating according to the orthodox people. These laws were actually deviating from what these laws were actually deviating from the very religious and cultural aspects of our life. And this is something they did not tolerate. Okay. Now, the inheritance rights as well as the Hindu religious law schools such as Daibhag and Mitakshra were also challenged, fine. Along with that, the authorities of the Pandits and Malvis have also been uh, challenged, fine. That was one thing. And most importantly is this. What is this? This is the Religious Disabilities Act of 1850. So, you know, when someone wanted to convert, their parents could stop them by saying that if you convert, we're going to disown you. But with the Religious Disabilities Act, anyone who converted was given the right over their paternal property. So, legally, they were given this right that they would have claim on their paternal property even if they have converted. So, this was again a very major, this, this had a very major impact. On the families also, okay. Now, let's talk about the military causes. So, most of the Indian recruits in the armed forces were foot soldiers, they were sepoys and most importantly, they could never rise beyond the level of subedar, fine. The salaries which they were getting, the remunerations which they were getting was really, really low, okay. Now, apart from that, they were also discontent with the recent order which was given that they would not be given foreign service allowance. What do you mean by this? So, when I go to a foreign country on behalf of my company, my company pays for everything, my lodging, my boarding, my food, everything. But if the Britishers are sending the Indian soldiers on foreign locations for services, they would not be giving them any extra allowance. The sepoys would be asked to use their own salaries for their survival there. So this again was seen as a very, uh, you can say, discriminatory policy that you are sending us and you're not even providing us with any kind of allowance. Okay, then you have the Post Office Act, which was passed in 1854, which stated that the British sepoys the Indian soldiers who are working in the British Armed Forces, they will no longer have the privilege of free postal services. They would have to pay for their services. Okay. Now, uh, there was one more thing that is the General Service Enlistment Act, which stated that Indian soldiers will have to serve in foreign locations. Now, there was a belief in Hinduism that 
you should not cross the seas because if you do you're going to lose your caste or you can lose your religion so instead of the britishers respecting this they passed an act which was known as the general service enlistment act of 1856 which made it compulsory for the soldiers to be ready for overseas deployment so this again was seen as the britishers trying to interfere in the religious matters of the people and in this religious matter only i would like to add one more and a very major cause here and that was the immediate cause you can say the final nail in the coffin and that was the enfield rifles all right so enfield rifles was in, uh, introduced by henry harding and what was the problem with this rifle so the rifle would have a cartridge all right the cartridge the cover of the cartridge was actually made out of animal skin most importantly and the cover of the cartridge would be covered with what it would be coated with the fat of cows and pigs now understand that cows are sacred for hindus and pigs are haram for people who follow islam so using that rifle was something which really affected the religion of both the communities and hence both the communities were completely against using the enfield rifles but the britishers again instead of respecting this they forced the armed forces to use the enfield rifles a lot of them were court martialed if they refused to use it so all these this was the final nail in the coffin and people rose up in revolt right and mangal pande is called as the first shaheed swatantrata sangram ke pehle shaheed he is called as that okay so he rose up in revolt there were other infantries there were other regiments of the armed forces who have risen up in revolt all right so these were your major causes causes of the revolt of 1857 or as i would like to call it causes of the first war of independence okay so i really hope these causes are absolutely clear to you if you have any doubts any questions please feel free to address them in the comment section below and i'll be more than happy to assist you with it okay so please do let me know if there's anything you did not understand So thank you so much for joining me here it was an absolute pleasure to have you all I'll keep coming back with more videos like this till then please take care and do let me know in the comment section if you have any issues any doubts any difficulties that you might be facing thank you so much bye bye